Reminded of a story that John Lennox tells. He went, uh, the Archbishop turned up at the church and there were a few there. And he said to the vicar or whatever, he said, uh, there's not many here. Did you tell them it was coming? And he said, no, somebody must have let the cat out of the bag. So there we are. Nice to be with you. And welcome to those on the Zoom too. Um, I just, I, I, as uh, uh, Brother Andrew was playing be before the, the meeting, that hymn that we sung, Almost Persuaded, I was reminded myself that uh, there's a wee lad of about 10. I, that was the first tune that I was able to pick out on the piano. Never had a, a piano lesson in my life, and that would show if you heard me play. But um, on so far, and I managed to, and I played um, two scales, I forgive my ignorance, but it's on black keys I play. I don't know what that means really, but that's all I can do. But they, they almost persuaded was the hymn that I was able to pick out and I played that incessantly until uh, even I got a bit fed up with the tune. But it's a lovely hymn, isn't it? And uh, it echoes what we are going to read in the story of um, Agrippa, King Agrippa. You'll probably not remember, because I don't want to flatter myself, but the last time I was here, I spoke on two uh, good men, men who were misunderstood. And I took up the subject of Zacchaeus, a philanthropist, giving half of his wages to the poor, and then suggesting that he would give uh, four times uh, anyone, to anyone he had defrauded. Uh, so the simple arithmetic would tell you that he was a good, giving, generous man. The other man that we thought about was the rich young ruler who um, came to the Lord and asked um, a question which many have criticized. Uh, and, and the Lord um, and he, in his discourse, showed that he was a good, moral, upright man. And I use good in the conventional sense of the word. So we come now from two good men who met the Savior and were influenced by it, and at least one embraced the teaching of the Savior and became a Christian, Zacchaeus. We're not sure about the rich young ruler, but uh, touchingly, the scripture says that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. <laughs> That's a lovely touch, isn't it? So from turning from two good men, we come now to two despotic, evil, wicked men, uh, Felix and King Agrippa. And we'll have a look at them and see that indeed the gospel can reach the other side of the spectrum, uh, the, the, the wicked that we could not even contemplate and, and the, 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 the sins that they uh, committed would, would hardly bear a public uh, conversation. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the gospel was presented to them by the apostle Paul. And um, we'll look at that and just see how we get on. We've got two parts to our uh, talk. We've got talking about Felix, who he was, and uh, how he interacted uh, with Paul. And then we'll look at King Agrippa and just see how we get on with him. Uh, Felix's full name was Marcus Antonius Felix. And you'll remember, and I... Um, just refreshing your memory about these things. It was an occupied country, Judea, by the Roman Empire, and they put in place a procurator, which Felix was, uh, and he, they, he was supposed to govern. And they weren't stupid, the Romans, and they put in place men who would just do their bidding uh, at the expense of the Jewish community. And Felix was such a man. Um, he, he, he was the fourth procurator of Judea, uh, and he held office in about 52 AD to 60 D AD, and he seemed to die just shortly after his tenure uh, at that, and he seemed to have died of tuberculosis. These uh, things are not mentioned in the scripture, but that would be, be history. He had married three times. Two of his wives were called Drusilla, and I suppose that made it easy for him uh, at home uh, when he called out for his wife. But um, one of, and one of this, the, the second Drusilla, it was the sister of King Agrippa. Uh, so there was that link between the two. Um, they had a son and he died in 79 AD uh, in Pompey when Mount Vesuvius erupted and uh, buried so many people there. He was there. 
Tacitus, the writer, the, the Jewish writer, uh, described Felix as a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king in the spirit of a slave. So we can see that there seems to be so far no redeeming feature in this man. Uh, he, it's rumored that he crucified people and he put to death those who uh, stood in his way. He had the high priest, uh, a man called Jonathan, killed in the temple. He hired men to hide daggers under their cloak. And as they went into the temple, Jonathan, the high priest, was slain because he had criticized Felix and his tenure in Judea. The time that we are thinking he would be about 65 years of age when he met Paul and had to do with him. And I suppose suppose we'll pick up the reading. That's the background on the reading we find in Acts chapter 24. And for the sake of time, because I'm not going to be long this evening, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, we are going to read uh, Acts chapter 24 and starting at verse 24 to 27. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So this is so far so good. Felix is keen to meet Paul and to hear something of the faith, of faith in Christ. And as he reasoned in righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Well, that's it. He's wanting to think about these things and he wants to call uh, Paul for further discussion. You would imagine until we read uh, verse 26, he hoped also that money should have been given him by Paul that he might lose him. Therefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him, hoping that this little man, Paul, standing in front of him, would be able to give him money. Well, Paul writes in Second Corinthians, says he, I have nothing. So he was on a loser there, wasn't he? Hoping to get something from, from Paul. Um, so there we are. That's the, uh, the, the last verse of that chapter says, but after two years, Porcius Festus, that was uh, Felix's successor as procurator, uh, came into Felix's room and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So that's the kind of person he was. Um, and, and I thought we would look at what his problem was, what uh, Felix's problem was, and then we would try and see how uh, Paul sought to uh, counter that problem that he would have. And the first thing that uh, he, we see about and, and know about Felix was that he was a particularly cruel person. I mean, even leaving Paul uh, bound in prison for two years um, just seems completely uh, unrighteous and unstanding. And cruel to, to, to do such a thing. And we know from history that he was a particularly cruel person. And to counter that, uh, Paul speaks to him of righteousness. Uh, what did Felix know of righteousness? Well, he would know little in his private life, that was for sure. He trod on, the, uh, on people who, 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 who went against him, uh, caring nothing for their feelings or for their life, in fact. And here Paul speaks to him of righteousness, to counteract the cruelty of this man, Felix. And I suppose the problem with us too is that we too must address this subject of righteousness in our life. And you might say, well, I mean, I, I, I can understand that this man, Felix, was despotic. He was uh, cruel to, to an extent that we cannot imagine. Um, but surely... Um, I'm not like that, and I'm sure you're not. Good people of Kennaway and the environments are upright people. And to, to, to think that way is to misunderstand really the ways of God and to misunderstand really the subject of, of sin in our lives. Um, the, the Bible tells us that each one of us, in the light of the scriptures, must face the fact that we have in our lives and have committed in our lives sin. And therefore, there is that barrier between ourselves and God. It doesn't really matter. I'm not too concerned this evening about the extent of cruelty of Felix or extent of cruelty and the wickedness of Akriba. That's, by the way, I'm demonstrating this evening that God's love, God's salvation is presented to each person, whether they're at one end of the spectrum 
or excuse me, or the other end of the spectrum. God's message to us is the same. And Paul would preach that and he preached to him righteousness. And uh, we would, would no doubt lay before Felix the fact that his life was far from righteous and needed to be righteous to get into that full relationship with God. Then he spoke about temperance. Well, what did Felix know about temperance? It, it seems precious little. Did as he pleased. I mentioned he was married three times and it's, it's extremely dubious how he went about these marriages and what he did to existing husbands and so on. Um, and so he just took what he wanted. And, and to be honest, that's, the, that's the, the, the feeling today we have, haven't we? Are we not abhorred when we read or see or hear? I mean, who has not been completely and utterly devastated at hearing that little fellow Arthur? And you just wonder at the, the, the human heart that can, that can sustain such cruelty against a, a little defenseless soul. And you might say, well, that's far removed from where I am, and I'm sure you're absolutely right. But in the heart of each one of us works these things. And, 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 and Paul speaks to Felix that day concerning temperance, self-control, self-discipline, which will come, up, come through faith in Christ. And we see that Paul would write of that in the Romans when he would, 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 would weigh up things and say there's, there's a way of, of the law of sin and death and there's a way of the law in, of life in Christ Jesus and these would, things would be opposed to each other and we who are Christians seek to live by the life which is through faith in Christ Jesus. And Paul and Felix uh, to, to, to his, he, he, he was listening and we have read it the man trembled because Paul not only spoke about righteousness and temperance, but he spoke of judgment to come. We sang about that, didn't we, in our last verse? Almost persuaded. Doom comes at last. The awfulness of facing a Christless eternity without Christ as your saviour is it, almost too Awful to contemplate. Now, I'm not a turn and burn uh, type of uh, preacher. Uh, and, and no gospel preacher really likes to speak about the awfulness of departing this life without Christ. Paul would speak to Felix and he would speak to him of these things. And it would say that in the light of the Spirit of God speaking through Paul, it was that he trembled. He was also a great procrastinator, wasn't he? Uh, we, we, we read about that. You know, he, he, he left them two, two years in, in prison. He deferred while he waited for someone else to come and so on. And he seems to be that sort of person that put off things, put off things, put off things. And again, uh, the, 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 the subject of judgment to come, the inevitability of it. No manana, manana, manana for uh, for for uh, the, 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 the death which was to come. Shortly after, uh, Paul stood and, sp and spoke to him. And he said, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I, 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 you, we can't judge the man's motives when he says that, but it is odd that he left uh, Paul two years in the prison uh, and never seemed to call him again after that time. So, fully we suggest from the word of God was left to face a Christless eternity. King Agrippa, uh, we'll read about him in chapter 26. And the title of this message, The Tragedy of Felix and uh, Agrippa, is apt when we understand something of King Agrippa's life. That's Acts 26 verse 24 to 29 we'll read. Uh, and as he does speak for himself, um, he, now, now Paul's giving his, his uh, discourse. Uh, he's ta talked about his uh, conversion uh, on the road to Damascus that uh, Fraser referred to in his prayer. And he, uh, and, and he speaks uh, and, and he's speaking. Uh, and he's thus spake, Paul thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, he seems to be a coarse kind of fellow, shouting out uh, uh, in the middle of uh, Peter's, uh, Paul's discourse, 
He says, uh, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning hath made thee mad. But Paul said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness, for the king knoweth of these things before which also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophet? Now, this is an amazing verse, this, and we'll, we'll, we'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto him, uh, and to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. King Agrippa. Full name, Marcus Julius Agrippa. He was the son of Agrippa I. And we'll remember if we read chapter 12 of Acts the Apostles, what happened there. King Agrippa came and he had a silver coat on. Scripture doesn't speak about that, but Josephus, the, 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 the Roman uh, uh, commentator, does. He came and he had a silver coat on. And the light, the sun shining on this uh, silver coat, so entranced the people that they said, here is not a man, but here is God. And um, Herod Agrippa uh, was enchanted by this assessment. And he fell immediately ill. And Josephus, uh, Josephus tells us that he lay for some time and understood that he was no god but man because of his ailment he had a stomach complaint and within five days he was dead this was the man, this was the father of this man and it says that he we didn't read it but it tells us that he came in in great pomp he had learned nothing from history and so there we are we have king agrippa now coming and hearing the, 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 the preaching of Paul, and Paul gives his testimony, and it's always good to give a testimony uh, to, to, to see how God saves us and, and presents us uh, <laughs> perfect before him. And so um, they, they, they will think of the problems that King Agrippa had that needed to be addressed by, by Paul. And there's a, the, the, the danger of believing the scriptures inadequately. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Agrippa didn't uh, um, contradict him. So uh, Agrippa had, had, had a knowledge of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the prophets, of the teaching. And no doubt he had in mind things, as, as Paul was speaking to him, of the prophecies of Christ's coming throughout the, the New Old Testament that was there. And Paul spoke of these things, and Agrippa could understand them. And he believed. Now, that word believe is, is, is the word that we say in, when, when we preach the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's the same word. And I'm always struck by that man who shouts in, this, in, the, in, in the gospels. Uh, but to the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. What, what do you mean? Do you believe or don't you believe? Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And I would suggest that what, Paul, what the Agrippa had here was that surface belief. That understanding, that mental asset, that agreeing with, that uh, understanding that these things were true. That's the belief that the, the man in the Gospels had. And that's the belief that Agrippa had here. A surface belief, which went no deeper than that. And there's a danger in that, in thinking that a knowledge of the Scriptures and the knowledge of Christ and a mental asset to these things are the means whereby we come into God's salvation. And we'll see in a moment that that's not the case. And verse 28 tells us. Then Agrippa said to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now we'll, 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 we'll analyze that phrase in a moment. But taking that face value uh, at, at the moment, it would seem that Agrippa was saying, I'm convinced by your arguments. Uh, and I'm almost there, but not quite. And, uh, the Fraser in his introduction, a, a, a knowledge about the, the, the hymn, spoke of that, didn't he? And the danger is that we might almost be persuaded, 
but not quite move to there. The correct understanding, as I understand it, is something different. And in fact, it shows Agrippa in not such a pleasant light, because some translations would tell us that the correct understanding of this is, you are trying to make me a Christian with very few uh, words and with little evidence. So it seems to be a sort of cynical sneering uh, to Paul, that here you are, Paul, hoping to make me a Christian, but you've only just scratched the surface of these things for me. And I'm not convinced with the evidence that you've described that I need to become a Christian. What does Paul, what, but Paul has addressed these things. If we go back to verse 18 of the same chapter, chapter 26, uh, he says, uh, uh, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. That's his, his instructed, the, the Lord's instructing Paul. Uh, and to, to turn them from darkness to light. Well, if there was anyone who dwelt in darkness, it was Agrippa. He was another one whose uh, lifestyle uh, was very questionable and uh, hardly bears thinking about. Uh, the, these men were just men of the times, uh, looking after number one, amassing fortunes at everyone else's expense and to the end to the Roman uh, masters back there in Rome. Living in darkness, and Paul is saying to them, you must turn from darkness to light. Well, we think immediately of the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, light, life. And he also said, I am the light of the world. And Paul was telling Agrippa that he must turn from that darkness into light. He, wants, he says to, to him that you must open their eyes. And uh, so many people are blinded, aren't they, to the ways of salvation. Few people care that's, I, I think the, the saddest thing about life today is that people are indifferent to the, the, to the, to, to the, the claims of the gospel, indifferent to God's uh, love demonstrated to them, indifferent to the death of Christ at Calvary. But what's more uh, is this, is in verse 18, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now Agrippa held or heard all this, turn, open your eyes, turn from darkness to life, that you might find the forgiveness of sins. And this is kernel to the preaching of the gospel. This is kernel to your salvation. This is absolutely essential that all your sins which you have, past, present and future, may I say, have got to be forgiven. And they can only be forgiven on the ground of shed blood of Christ at Calvary. That's the very reason he came. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, so that he might die that awful death at Calvary. And I'm sure, like you, uh, we uh, remembered the Lord this morning, remembered his sufferings, remembered the love that brought him there, remembered the awful. We, we sung, uh, you know, it struck me just a, a few days ago, we sing about the old rugged cross, and uh, that's uh, hymnology, but I suppose that must be right, a rugged cross, and the, 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 the Saviour's back was laid bare um, like a ploughed field, and against the, the, the cross. What must the physical agony of the Saviour been like? We, 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 we can't contemplate that. What, what must the mental anguish of the Saviour, because the Bible tells us that he knew sin became sin for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. This was all true of the sinless, perfect life of Christ. So that we, through his death, through the shedding of his blood, might find the forgiveness of sins. Well, have you got it? You know, in the, in the final analysis, in the judgment that's to come, um, if your sins are not forgiven, you might be the most outstanding person in Kenway, and I, I wouldn't dispute that. You will stand on the same side as Felix and Agrippa. And you will be judged because of that. And we might be a million miles from the cruelty and the debauchery of these evil, wicked, horrible men. And yet we will suffer a fate which will be theirs. And why? Because, and let's go back to what um, uh, Griffith said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What's stopping you? Well, I know what's stopping you because it stopped me for a few years. Uh, I, I knew the gospel. And it was the hardness of my heart that would not just simply embrace Christ. 
So that's what it's about, isn't it? A, a, a willingness to go our own way. A, 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 a revulsion against giving ourselves into this, uh, to submitting ourselves to, 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 to Christ and becoming a his slave and, and him becoming our master. That's what happens to those people. That's what happened to Felix when I have a more convenient time. You can almost sense how he dismissed Paul. I'll call on you. Almost now persuades me to be a Christian. Paul, I'm not convinced by the few words that we've had here and, uh, and, and, and you've showed little evidence of it. And you're like, well, if he had thought about it, the whole evidence was seen in the life of Paul. Paul was, uh, if he's not, if he couldn't accuse him of being a murderer, he certainly was not accessory after murder. He chased people, the Christians down. To committed them to death and to blasphemy and to all sorts of things the scriptures would say. And here was this little man standing. It was, I find it quite amusing in a way that Felix and uh, Agrippa were there to judge um, Paul. And all of a sudden, Paul is the judge and they're sitting in the dock. And he is now telling them of the judgment to come. They might think that they are going to commit them to Caesar and they might, Caesar might put them to death and all the rest of it. They might have thought that they were. And here was this little Paul just standing there judging them for their behavior and for their lifestyles. And I find that quite telling. Dear friend, almost persuaded to be a Christian. The Holy Spirit does his mysterious work in the hearts of those who are seeking Christ. And may it be that this afternoon, you simply trust Christ, not almost persuaded, but altogether persuaded, to place your heart's confidence and faith in Christ so that you might pass from darkness to life, so that your eyes might be open, so that you might have forgiveness of sins and stand complete in the presence of God, acceptable by him because of the death of Christ on Calvary. Shall we pray together? Our eternal God and Father, we who are thine, bow in thy presence and thank thee that we were ever considered by thyself. Before the foundation of the world, we were in thy heart, and what a thought that is. And But we return thee thanks for thy goodness towards us, thy love demonstrated to us in the giving of thy Son at that awful place. And so we thank thee for the uh, salvation that we have come into through faith in Christ, that we would understand that the blessings that we receive now, the spiritual blessings, are just a foretaste of that which thou hast in store for us who believe. The eternal bliss of the company of Christ in eternity is just beyond our understanding, but we believe it to be true and we thank thee. But our prayer this afternoon is for those whose faith may not be in Christ, who are not persuaded to become a Christian, who would dismiss it like Felix and say another in more convenient time, we'll think about these things, not understanding the brevity of life, the shortness, and we just commend such people to thyself and ask that thy spirit will be gracious and that they might come into a knowledge of Christ and embrace him as their Lord and Saviour. We ask these things in the Saviour's precious, peerless, matchless name. Amen. <laughs>